Um, I sent you guys on OneNote, if you're a OneNote user, the slides that I'm gonna do today. So if you want to look at them, I sent them to your unit seven um, and they're there. I see them. Yay. All right. So like um, chi-square, this is the other like major math thing that I would say AP Bio has. It's like chi-square and Hardy Weinberg are the two things that are like new math concepts that are related to AP Bio. There's also, you might remember from like your summer assignment in like the dark ages where you had like population growth and like some stuff like that. Area volume um but those things i think are not that hard and also you have a formula sheet for them and also you like calculated area before so it's not that big of a deal this is something that will feel new to you but i promise it's like very doable so remain calm a few of the pictures won't oh no is that just me is it just there's only can one picture loading them? for me three the three on the left are not loaded okay yeah like these ones all the way, the Hardy yeah. Weinberg ones? Yes, those three. Okay. Or refusing to. Can you see them on mine? I can see them on right, right there. I mean, like on my, if you go to my notebook, can you see them? Uh, let me check. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can copy them and paste them, but I already did it for you, Hadley. I put them on your untitled page. Thank you. You're welcome. That was when I put the Jack, I'll just give it to you too. Oh. Does anyone else need it? The pages? Oh, okay. <laughs> you just shouldn't give it to him. Whoa. Jack. You were late. For like half a second. Oh, way more than that. It worked. Why is OneNote the worst right now? Okay. There you go, Jack. All right, Virginia. If you're on Zoom and you need the pages, send me a chat, okay? Now OneNote is gonna have a freak out because that's what this week is gonna be like for me. <laughs> Try again. Um, try, if yours is not loading, try closing out your OneNote and reopening it and see if that works. It might not work. And if it doesn't, then like, you already tried. You have less than one. Okay, Virginia, yours are on your untitled page at the top, okay? Thank you. 26 pages. McKenna. Oh, yours is three. Thank you. Even though I have nothing to do with it. Who else needs Hardy Weinberg? I'll just send you one of these out. I did receive it. If I were a boy, I give them that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. I think. Okay. Is that a little bit weird? Haley, they're on your untitled page at the <laughs> top. You do? Well, I don't know. Anybody else? Yeah. Emery. Yeah. Emery. yeah. Emery. Riley. And Riley? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what? Anybody else? <laughs> All right, Riley, you're good. Thank you. All right, everyone, here we go. So back to the beginning. Hardy Weinberg is just a mathematical model that you can use to tell if a population is evolving. Here's the model. So there's two formulas that are important. The first one is this one that P squared plus Q squared um, plus two PQ equals to one. So each of these like segments of the population, or sorry, of the formula is related to part of the population. So in this situation, P squared, oops, I don't wanna use the highlighter. P squared is equal to the frequency. Oh, this is actually already on this slide. So I'm not going to write it, but it's the frequency of the, actually I am going to write it because I like it visual. So P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared equals to one. 
So when you look at this, P squared is the frequency of what's on on your untitled page. Yeah. It's four. You should look through a flashlight. Oh my god, I don't like it. It's right. there on mine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. What? All right. So back to this. We have our p squared is the frequency of homozygous dominant. Focus. Two pq is your frequency of heterozygous individuals, which literally means two times p times q. I think you know that. And then q squared is your frequency of homozygous recessive. This thing is big. Okay. Now, all of these numbers, when you add them together, should equal to one, which means all of these numbers should be less than one, right? So when you start doing these problems and you're like, oh, P squared is 13, like, no, it's for sure not. It needs to be like 0.13 or, you know, it's a, it's a decimal always, okay? Then you have another formula that's equally helpful, which is P plus Q equals to one. So P is just your frequency of your dominant allele. So this is different than P squared because if you're homozygous dominant, how many dominant alleles do you have? Two, right. So like this individual would be, I'll use Bs. BB. B. This is just the frequency of capital B. Okay. Plain P. That's why it's would be the square root of that. Okay. Q, I'm sure you can guess, is the frequency of your recessive allele. which is lowercase. So your Q squared is two little letters, okay? And your two PQ, those individuals are one capital and one lowercase, okay? So the reason it adds to one is that if you add together all the possible genotypes in the population, you should equal to 100%, which is one, okay? If you add up all the alleles in the population, it should equal to all the alleles, which is 100%, which is one, okay? So as I, um, I'm gonna do some sample problems of this and you'll be able to see how it works, but you can kind of use both of these equations together, almost like a puzzle solving situation. When you do this, we're always gonna start with our recessive ones when you do these problems. And I'm gonna make a note of that down here. It says always start with your recessive. And the reason why is because if the problem tells you like 46% of the population has brown eyes, do you know whether they're homozygous dominant or heterozygous? No. No. But if you know that 54% of the population has blue eyes, they're all this. So you can start from here and work yourself back in this direction to figure out how many of those brown eyed people are actually heterozygous and how many of them are actually homozygous. That's the number one mistake that happens with Hardy Weinberg is people start with their dominance and then they get the wrong answer because they set their brown eyed people or whatever equal to P squared. And it's not equal to P squared, it's equal to P squared plus two PQ because that's all the people who look dominant. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. All righty, so that's the formula. There are some conditions that like have to be true 
for Hardy Weinberg model as a model to work. Obviously it's a model. So that means like it's not perfect for every population and that's okay. But if you come down here, there are certain conditions that have to be true and are assumed for when we do these problems and we're like, this population is evolving and it's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, like hooray. Then we're assuming that all of these facts about that population are true. So those are that there's no mutation happening in the alleles that we're looking at. No new alleles are being added in. There's random mating, which means like one trait is not any more attractive than the other traits. There's no natural selection happening. So there's not like a selective pressure that's causing one trait to become like more common than the other. There's a large population size, which means there's a big gene pool and there's no gene flow, which is what we call migration. That means like all of the white bunnies happen to like leave. <laughs> that would put our model out of equilibrium um, and obviously it wouldn't work then. So. This bullet down here at the bottom is important that in real life, like usually all of these conditions are not met, but over long periods of time, populations do actually tend to like match up to the predictions of Hardy-Weinberg, which is pretty cool. What I wanna do now is tell you about some times when these things are not met and then we'll do a practice problem. So I'm gonna go over here and these are, one note is really killing me today, come on. All right, so this is when Hardy Weinberg oh, sorry. Okay. conditions are not met. And these are just some interesting evolution situations that happen that I think you're going to be like, wow, that's kind of cool. So the first one is genetic drift. Genetic drift happens when the population size is really, really small, or there's random changes that make predicting the frequency of the different genes really hard. You might know this, but in small populations, um, it's more likely that like recessive, harmful, or you sometimes hear them called like deleterious alleles will start to become more common, which you might be familiar with um, the concept of like, if you have a bunch of like related organisms that are mating, then like weird traits will start to sort of come to the surface. Um, and that would be sort of like a bottleneck situation. There's two examples of genetic drift. And one thing that I need to tell you is that this word random is really important. So like there's no selection. It's just like a totally random event that causes some traits to be more common than others. Two of the biggest examples are the founder effect, which is also like sometimes called the island model. That's like some mice were like randomly on a ship that like sailed from Spain to America. And when the ship got to America, the mice got off the ship and it was only like a small population of mice. And now like the mice in America are kind of different than the mice in Spain because only those genes were like carried over, if that makes sense. Or like a shipwreck or um, it's like that with horses too. Like horses are not native to here, but they like were brought over. So basically you're taking like a small number of individuals from the original population, which means you're not taking all the variation that exists. You're putting them in a new place and they're gonna reestablish like the gene pool there. That's the founder effect. Bottleneck effect is really similar, but this is like, there's some sort of catastrophe that knocks out like a ton of the members of the population, like a volcano erupts or tsunami. there's, yeah, tsunami or something like mm -hmm. unpredictable and random, which would not be natural selection because no organisms have an advantage over the other in that case. Like when there's a volcano, no one is like, I have higher fitness to survive this. Like, no, you don't, you're all the same. Um, I'm going to show two pictures of this in just a second. And then also is gene flow, which can't happen if there's going to be Hardy-Weinberg. This is just immigration and emigration. What's the difference? One is coming. Yes. One Do you know which one is which? M is coming. M is leaving. I, M is coming. Yeah, this is in. Immigration is in. That was my first guess. Emigration is out. 
leaving, enters, leaves. So this means like if you have either a bunch of new ducks that enter the population and they have green bills and there were no green bills before, like you're adding genetic variation that didn't used to exist. If you have a bunch of brown ducks that leave the population, now suddenly you've like removed some of the variation in the population. So it's altering the frequencies without it being like because of evolution. So these two things, if they're happening, your Hardy-Weinberg equation won't work right. Okay, I'm gonna show some pictures that are related to this. Here's the first one. This is like the island model. So this is, for some reason, when the bugs got onto the island, only the red ones went. And it's just random. It's not like the red ones were better. It's like, just that's what happened. So that means as these bugs continue to reproduce, the variation that existed on the mainland will not exist on the island. This is what happened with the Galapagos turtles too. If you're familiar with them, like some of them have super long necks because they eat cactus pads. And some of them have like really short necks because they eat brush and like they are on separate islands. It's really interesting. This is actually why Darwin like went to the Galapagos because the diversity is like way different than the mainland of South America. And he like figured that out. So he was like, I'm gonna go to the islands. Also probably better weather. Anyways, this is the bottleneck situation. So you have some sort of, obviously this is just a model, but you have some sort of like, ah, catastrophe. Only a few organisms survive it. Which means that now you're not gonna have really any yellow. You're not gonna have any white. You're just gonna have a population of like blue marbles. So you've removed all the variation, okay? That would be the bottleneck effect. Okay, good so far. Okay, another thing that can't be true is that no, there has to be random mating. In real life, there's a very interesting situation called sexual selection, which means that some traits are literally just more attractive than other traits for animals, which means that if you're a male and you have that trait, you're more likely to get a mate and your genes are more likely to be passed on. Hooray for you. If not, you're less likely to pass on your traits. Usually it is the female's decision of which traits are more favorable, sorry. All right, so another thing that's interesting about this is that this is a key thing here. Like this is not because they're advantageous, they're literally just attractive. <laughs> An example of this is like red cardinals or like this peacock here. If you're a cardinal and you live in a pine forest, is it an advantage to be red? No. For sure not. For sure it's not an advantage, but it's attractive. Hey, looking cute. Right, exactly. So that's why that trait has been passed on and on and on. So now like all the male cardinals are red because the brown ones didn't get any mates and they died <laughs> and their genes didn't get passed on. So even though the trait is like dis disadvantageous, <laughs> It's still like, well, we like it though. So it gets passed down. You know, cardinals are superficial. <laughs> yeah, a lot of birds are actually. This is like really common in birds. Um, <laughs> if you've ever seen the planet Earth with the birds of paradise and they like dance yeah. Yeah. and they like yeah. clean yeah. the area <laughs> and they like do all these things. I will, I will. I will. I'll show it. Um, yeah, but they like do all these things that are like not helpful to their survival just so they can like pass on their genes. Why are birds so mean? They are mean. Birds are mean. Um, okay, so there's two types there's intersexual selection. This is the one that's female choice. So this is the one that's like more familiar. It's like the, that trait gets passed on because she chose it. This one, intrasexual, means that within the males, there's some sort of competition for resources that will like attract mates. Um, it means like within the same sex, there's competition for that. So maybe like in some species, the male like presents the female with a gift or something like that. So like the ability to get that thing would be intra like species penguins. competition. They yeah. Bring, they bring like little rocks. Yeah. That's really sweet. It's a it's a big bird thing. I don't I mean, know that's why, so but cute. it is. I, don't penguins mate for life? 
I, I think they do, yeah. It's really sweet. So what this eventually causes is sexual dimorphism. And this is like where the males and the species look really different from the females. And I'll write that. So this is males and beta fish and females. Yeah. Female beta fish look ugly. very different. Typically, especially in birds, like we've been talking about, what you'll see is like the males will be super beautiful, colorful, crazy feathers, the whole shebang, um, some insects too. The females will be like a regular looking brown bird. <laughs> It'll just be like whatever. And that's typically what you'll get. This example is with the peacock where this is a female peacock. It's literally just like a large brown bird. <laughs> it doesn't have the colorful feathers. The males are the only ones that are like, ah, here I am, look at me. So yeah, he is. Oh, look at him go. That's what they do. Also peacocks are pretty mean. I don't know if you if you know that, but Imagine like that thing chasing not you. Not really friendly. Like, like, <laughs> peacocks are the only thing I can see that aren't in cages. I have no idea. So literally imagine that thing came, like chasing you with all of its feathers. Yeah, it'd be scary. How big does it go? I mean, I don't know the size, but that looks pretty large. <laughs> Here's another example of intra oh, you know, species. Really so this is a <laughs> tree frog situation. In the tree frog situation, you have some males that have a short call and some males that are have a that have a long call. This is actually like a crazy thing where maybe like the genes are linked somehow to survival because the they did this like experiment on this where they mated the female to both. The offspring of the father with the long call survived better. Like they just had better survival as larva, better growth as larva, and then also they had a shorter time to like metamorphosis, which means like they were tadpoles for shorter. So they're more able to defend themselves after metamorphosis. Okay, long call. So for some reason, like this long call actually is linked to survival and that gene will be passed on more frequently than the others. Yeah. So again, this is something that in Hardy Weinberg, we're saying like, this is not happening because we have to assume that like, there's just random mating within the population happening and no one trait is like more attractive than any of the others. Okay. I think sexual selection is like one of the most interesting <laughs> things that animals do. Okay. Um, another thing that can happen in real life is again, that some traits are more advantageous than the other. So this means for humans, we're diploid. We have two copies of each allele. And what that allows is that recessive alleles can hide, even if they're bad. Mm -hmm. So we're able to pass them on, even though like we don't want to. Color blindness. Yeah, like color blindness. And then the big example that I'm gonna talk about is sickle cell, which I think you are maybe familiar with the situation with that. Um, but we have this thing called balancing selection, which means that two forms of the trait will persist even if one of them is like not great. And that's because we have two copies of each gene. Like we're, we're able to like carry different traits. And I'll make a note of that here that this is allows for carriers. Like with um, cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs, sickle cell anemia, most of the like genetic disorders that we talk about are recessive and most of them are like this, where people who actually have those disorders a lot of time aren't living to reproductive age, um, especially with like Tay-Sachs. But because people are carriers, the disease like continues. Yeah, it is unfortunate. Um, one thing that's interesting is something called the heterozygote advantage which means that for some reason, people who are heterozygous or individual or animals, whatever it is, have an advantage over individuals who are either homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive. So I'm gonna zoom over here real quick. This is an example of this. This is the situation with malaria and sickle cell. So people who have, I'm just gonna use, on your genetics problems, it was like HBA and HBS. Actually, I'll use that since that's what it actually is. So HBA, HBA is the code for normal hemoglobin. These people obviously 
will not have sickle cell anemia, um, but they can get malaria. So these people, too big, can get malaria. If you don't know or you forgot, malaria is a parasite that's carried by mosquitoes. You only can get it from a mosquito and it affects um, red blood cells. But it's actually like, a, it's not a bacteria or a virus, it's a protist, like a paramecium sort of thing. People who are, where's my blue? HBA, HBS, which the S is recessive, recessive. These people still have normal blood, but because of their sickle gene that they're carrying, it's not affecting them, it's not giving them sickle cell, but their hemoglobin is just a little bit different. They can't get malaria, say malaria resistant. So like that's what we got. Right, so this is the heterozygote advantage right here because these people don't have sickle cell and they don't, can't get malaria. But they can give their kids sickle cell. Correct, that's the, that's the <laughs> issue. So then you have people who are HBS, HBS. Yes. These people have sickle cell. They get malaria. They cannot get malaria. They're malaria resistant. Okay. But sickle cell, is a super painful genetic disorder. People who have sickle cell go into these like crises where basically what's happening is their blood is clotting when it's not supposed to because instead of their blood cells being circular, they're like crescent moons. Mm -hmm. So they're like hooking onto each other and causing these like really painful blood clot situations in small capillaries like their hands. And they're triggered by things like cold, smoke, like things that would normally affect your circulation can trigger them into a crisis that can last for like a week. It's super bad. Um, also people with sickle cell have a pretty low life expectancy. It's like in the forties, which is really low. So what that means is that these people who have sickle cell have lower fitness than these people because sickle cell is likely to kill them at a young age. These people, who don't have sickle cell have lower fitness than these people because they could get malaria and die. Malaria can kill you. So that means these people have a heterozygote advantage. But like Hadley said, they can have children. If you have two people who are carriers, they are both like living a long life because they can't get malaria and they can't get sickle cell. But they can have a children who has sickle cell, a child who has sickle cell, and they can have a child who can get malaria. So what you end up seeing is higher frequencies of the sickle cell allele in areas that have higher prevalence of malaria. Because in these areas like Sub-Saharan Africa, India, the Middle East, and also Central America, this is on this map, you have malaria as like a selective factor, right? But if you come up here, let's say you live like in Spain, you have a less tropical climate, which means you have less mosquitoes, which means you have less malaria. So then, which one is the most advantageous if you don't have a mosquito problem? This person. This one, right? So the heterozygote advantage is interesting because it only is true in certain areas. And that's why sickle cell is more common in especially people of sub-Saharan African descent. But there you go. Fascinating. All right. Um, and then you also have a few other things that I'm not gonna talk about too much, but frequency dependent selection just means that for some reason, like when the trait becomes more common, it becomes less advantageous. It's like only, basically it's like only special when it's rare. <laughs> it would be like, like if all of a sudden diamonds became super common, people would be like, whatever. And like, I don't care. It's that sort of deal. Um, and then neutral variation is when the mutation just like doesn't, doesn't matter. It's a, a silent mutation like we talked about before when we did mutation. So it like won't really do anything. All right.
here's the last thing about this, and then we're going to do a practice problem. Um, you might be like, okay, well, evolution does all these things and it like chooses all this stuff and it like seems like it's doing a good jobs. So, like, why isn't any organism like totally perfectly fit to their environment? And these are the reasons why that evolution doesn't just like start from scratch. It has to take something that already existed and modify that. Also, the modifications are random, which means that like sometimes it's what you wanted and sometimes it's not. Plus the diploidy situation where like it's really hard to get rid of bad recessive things. All right, let's do a practice problem. Time for fun. Okay, so I'm going back up here to this Hardy Weinberg example. I'm gonna do this one and then I'm gonna do one that's like an actual FRQ, a released FRQ. So you can see kind of like what this would be like on your AP test. Um, but we're gonna start with this simple one. So you've sampled a population in which you know that the homozygous recessive genotype is 36%. Using that 36% calculate all these things. This one is nice because it gave you the recessive to start with. So there's no way that you can get confused or lost in the sauce or whatever because it only gave you the recessive to start with. The number one thing you need to do is you need to go ahead and turn your percents into decimals, okay? We're not using percents, we're using decimals. So 36%, recessive is equal to 0 0.36. And which value of our equation is that gonna be equal to? Do you know or remember? Q, Q squared. squared. Okay, why is it Q squared? It's Q squared because these are the individuals who have the homozygous recessive genotype. So they don't just have one small a, they have two. So they're not Q, they're Q squared. And then just to help us out, I'm gonna put our equation, P squared plus two PQ plus Q squared equals one. This is on your formula sheet, but it's not hard to remember. Okay, so now basically how I like to do these problems is to work around in a big circle. So we have Q squared right now. We know that is 0 0.36, okay? Instead of trying to find these other things here, I'm gonna find just plain Q and work around that way. So then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my square root of 0 0.36. Can someone math that for me? Point six. Okay, so this is 0. 0.6. If you want to keep your decimals the same, you can, 0. 0.60. That's equal to Q. So then what we found in our list up here is the frequency of the small a allele. That's what Q is, small a. So this is 0. 0.6. This we already found, this is 0. 0.36. We just had to change our percent to a decimal. Now, what we can do is we can use Q to find P. So remember from our equations that P plus Q is also equal to one. So that means we can do one minus 0 0.6, and that will equal P, which is 0 0.4. That's our big A. Now we can use that to figure out our P squared and our 2PQ. So our P squared, we just have to square this, 0.4 squared, which I think is 0.16, right? I think so. I think so. Pretty sure, but sometimes I get twisted up. So 0.4 squared, yeah, 0.16. This is P squared. Yeah, which is our two big A's. So now we know this is 0.16. And our two PQ, all we have to do is two times 0.4 times 0 0.6. 0 0.4 times 0 0.6 times two equals 
that's going to be our heterozygous people. Now, here's the moment of truth, which is, I'll say this here, that AA is 0.16, AA is 0.48. Moment of truth that you can use to check your work, which is the most satisfying moment, is when you add up P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared, you should get one. Or if you did a lot of rounding, 0.99 or 1.01 or whatever, but it should be like one. Okay. And it is. This is. Good job. <laughs> Yay. So then you're like, check. If you get to the end and you start, I really recommend like doing this to check your work because if you do that and you're like, wait, why is it adding to three or whatever? Then you're like, oh no, this is wrong. Or like it's adding to 0. 0.7 or whatever. Okay. Feel good about that so far. Okay, let's try this next one. I think I sent it to you also, but I don't know if the image will show up. So if it doesn't, just watch me and I'll send it to you later. Thank you, Francis. Yeah. Yeah, it showed up. Okay, great. All right, so this one is from a long time ago, but it's the same. Nothing has changed really. So evolution is a unifying theme in biology. It involves changes in frequencies of alleles. For a particular genetic locus, the frequency of little a is 0.4 and the frequency of the dominant allele is 0.6. So this one's nice because it gave you, what did it give you? Which letters? P and Q. Yeah, it straight up gave you P and Q. So P is 0.6, which is dominant, that's A. And Q is 0.4, which is small a. So that means to find our big A, big A, that's P squared, so 0.6 squared is, 0.36, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Q squared is 0.4 squared. These are actually the same numbers we just did by accident. 0.16. And then 2PQ is 2 times 0.4 times 0.6, which I think was 0.48. Um, so this is two big A's, this is two small A's, this is big A, small A. Now, important when you're doing these questions, now it's easy to be like, woohoo, I did part A, that was easy and fun. But look, wait, there's more. So here we go. What is the frequency of the dominant phenotype? Okay. So to find the dominant phenotype, we have to add together everyone who has at least one big A. And that includes 0.48, which is our 2PQ, plus 0.36, which is our P squared. And that is, I am a person who like needs a calculator at this stage of my life. So if you feel that way, it's okay. 0.84. These people look dominant. Okay, just to like be clear, because some of the problems on your practice will be like this. This means 84% of the population looks dominant. That's what it is. It's, it's a frequency, which is also a percent. That means if it asked you like out of a thousand people, how many will look dominant, your answer would be, a thousand times 0.84, which would be 840 people. So you just pay attention to what it's asking, okay? Okay, so then often it will be like asking you other questions related to Hardy Weinberg now. You're like, yay, I did it, but like now I have to explain it, what it is. So you pay attention to that. How can Hardy Weinberg be used to determine whether this population is evolving? Anyone have any ideas? If it equals one, it's at equilibrium. If it doesn't, it's the problem. Good. Yeah. So, like, if equal to one, population is in equilibrium. Also, you could say, like, if all conditions for Hardy Weinberg 
are met, um, then you're in equilibrium. You could talk about either of those things. And then I think I've said this before, but like when you're doing this sort of problem, you keep your answers very short and concise. That's for you, for your time. Your AP readers, if you're taking this test, are not looking for you to write like a nice English essay. They're just looking for you to say literally the keywords and then they're giving you the points or they're not and they're moving on. So save yourself your sanity and don't write like an intro sentence or a conclusion sentence or anything like that. Just like lay it out, okay? All right, identify a particular environmental change and describe how it might alter allelic frequencies in this population. Um, anyone have an idea? It can, this is like many right answers here. No? The locusts only like one color. Sure, like one trait is more attractive than others. So which condition would not be met? Random mating. Or there is a volcanic eruption. Only a few of them survive. That means that there is some sort of like gene flow occurring. A bunch of mice leave the field, whatever. It can be, it didn't tell you what the organism was. So it's, you know, it could be anything. So you just say which conditions not met and locusts. why. Yeah, you did make up locusts. No, locusts, okay. So this word locust means location in a gene. A locust with a T is a large grasshopper. Yeah, and so I was like, well, that's a really weird animal for me to pick on random. But I was like, wait. It was seated in your brain. Okay, locust, locust. Okay, do you guys feel good? You think you can do it? Yeah. Okay, my number one biggest helpful hint to you is start with your recessives work yourself around in a circle. So find Q first, then use Q to find P. Don't start with your P's because you'll end up wrong, okay? Okay, practice sheet for this is on Google Classroom, but if you wanna print it to OneNote and do it there, that's fine. Um, or if you wanna use Kami or you wanna do your work on paper and submit images, it's totally up to you. What you want to do for this, as long as you somehow submit it, and it looks like this. Um, it will really help me grade this if you put your answers in the little boxes that go with the questions so that I can grade it quickly. And then the reason I need your work is so that if you get an answer wrong, I can give you partial credit for doing the work. Um, if you don't do your work, I can't give you partial credit for that. So 